Now I'm going to move forward with the chronological run-through. The titles of this film are unforgettable. This is perhaps my favorite part of the soundtrack, too. It feels almost like a Japanese interpretation from parts of Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. It gives us the recent history of plate tectonics, starting 200 million years ago. The plates had been moving much earlier than this, 3 to 3.5 billion years ago. The theory of plate tectonics wasn't fully accepted by the scientific community until 1967, which is only six years before this film was released. Scientists, though, had conceived of this idea much earlier. 200 million years ago was the Jurassic period in the Mesozoic era, when Pangaea split in two. The second part of this animation is 150 million years ago, showing the end of the Jurassic period when the split was complete. Next is 100 million years ago during the Cretaceous period, where we see the Atlantic Ocean widening. At 65 million years ago, at the end of the Cretaceous period, the Atlantic Ocean is much wider. The globe moves to the area of Japan and fast forwards to 30 million years ago in the Cenozoic era and the Oligocene epoch. Then 10 million years ago, during the Miocene epoch, Japan is still connected to Asia. Going forward to 3 million years ago in the Pliocene era, the northern territories of Japan are the only areas left connected to Asia. We're forwarded to the present, and the music sounds like an earthquake is about to happen. I swear this last part of the music, when the title shows up, the very loud part of the music at the end, that gives me goosebumps and makes my hair stand on end every time I hear it. The titles are so effective in giving us the mood of the movie. It's telling us, so much has happened before now, and so drastic over time, but what is going to happen next? And the titles give us exactly that, at least according to the story. The rest of the title sequence is a series of films of present-day Japan. The first one is a perfect one. A Series Zero Shinkansen train with Mount Fuji in the background. This title sequence is also effective because it's showing us all of Japan and how it will be gone. All these little clips we see are people having fun at festivals, people going to a racetrack, the baseball game, playing games, going to car shows, shipping cars for export, going to the beach and the cityscape, the subway stations filled with people, going to the water park, the sprawling streets. This type of photography reminds the audience of how busy Japan is and how many people are there and how dense the population can be. This part of the movie reminds me of the scenic videos from this show that are on YouTube. Now that I've done the titles, I want to pose a question to you. What if we just had the title sequence, and then the first thing that we see is the Tokyo earthquake, the second Great Kanto earthquake that happens? Would you prefer that, or would you prefer having the warm-up scenes that are leading to it? Because there's quite a few of them. I couldn't imagine just going to the quake right away. But that's why the quake scenes are such a big deal. We have the meaning and the gravity that leads up to it. We need the slow build, because that makes the disastrous events more meaningful. Just like in Earthquake 1974, there are four shocks to the big one. First, we're taken to Misaki Port, which is in the city of Miura, located at the tip of the Miura Peninsula. Miura is at the edge of the Uraga Channel, which is what inexperienced people would think is the entrance to Tokyo Bay, but is actually a channel that leads into the actual Tokyo Bay. The movie wastes no time in having our two main characters introduced to each other. Onodera meets Dr. Tadokoro. The characters are played by Hiroshi Fujioka and Keiju Kobayashi, respectively. Fujioka is most well known from the Kamen Rider series. He played Kamen Rider 1. The original TV series went from 1971 to 1973. It's an action-adventure story of a motorcycle-riding cyborg. The superhero's costume looks like a grasshopper sort of motif. He fights this evil organization founded by former Nazis called Shocker. The hero's name is Takeshi Hongo. Hiroshi Fujioka is a popular figure in Japan because of his work. Keiju Kobayashi was in 250 films during his career. Listeners will remember him from The Return of Godzilla from 1984, where he played Prime Minister Mitamura. He was in Sanjuro from 1963, directed by Kurosawa, too. 
Earlier in his career, he was in quite a few salaryman movies, particularly the company president comedies that Toho made. This first scene introduces us to the Wadatsumi No. 1 underwater vehicle. From the beginning, Tadokoro is intense and concerned. He's driven to know more. He has a single-minded purpose to find out what's happening on the ocean floor. Everyone is puzzled, a little weirded out by his forwardness. When the team of scientists are looking at the underwater footage, they conclude something's not right, that this island didn't disappear into the ocean because of volcanic activity, more like a landslide. Tadokoro is staring intensely and saying very little until he says he has no idea and that they'll have to check the Japan Trench. The Japan Trench stretches from the Kurile Islands to the Izu Islands along the east coast of northern Honshu. It regularly produces magnitude 7 earthquakes as well as tsunami. The 9.0 earthquake and resulting tsunami in 2011, known as the Tohoku earthquake, was produced by the Japan Trench subduction zone. It goes as deep as 26,398 feet, or over 8,000 meters. When this movie was made, the most recent earthquake that had occurred was an 8.2 or 8.3 magnitude quake in 1968 called the Tokachi earthquake. It produced a 20-foot tsunami. It caused significant damage and cut off communications between Honshu and Hokkaido. When they reach 8,000 feet, which is only 46 meters from the bottom, our characters are hit by a current, the most dynamic current they've ever seen. When they get jostled by this big force, they have to brace themselves, and they notice this muddy cloud. They launch a flare and they decide to go down at Tadakoro's insistence. So they measure that there's this current, and it has high density, it's north to south instead of east-west. What they're talking about here is a turbidity current. It's when high-density water, in other words, water with a high concentration of sediment in it, a lot of the time it's clay, and also a higher salt concentration, is a current not because of the water, but because of the sediment flow. Turbidity currents don't happen just underwater, but also when volcanoes unleash pyroclastic flows, lava flows, lahars, and where avalanches occur. It's the density of the material plus the gravity. It's not as much about the water or air driving the force, it's the density of the sediment or other rock that's in the air or the water. The sediment flow starts higher up and then it has a snowballing effect that increases the speed and the density of the flow as it keeps going, hence the current. The sediment that's in the water that's deposited is called turbidite. The disaster in this movie is referred to as a diastrophism. It's the first time I ran into this term, so I'll describe what that is. When there's a fault created, or if the Earth's crust folds, that is a diastrophism. It's when the Earth's crust deforms, dislocates, or distorts. And it's not about molten rock. This is the solid part of the crust we're talking about. And just a reminder, your geology midterm test will be on Friday and is 30% of your grade. In the next scene, Prime Minister Yamamoto arrives at the Kante, which is the name for the Prime Minister's residence. The Prime Minister is played by Tetsuro Tamba. He acted in movies for a very long time. I first saw him in You Only Live Twice, which is the Bond film from 1967. He played the part of Tiger Tanaka. I had also seen him in the 1964 film Kaidan, which is a marvelous film that you should see if you haven't seen it yet. He's also in a major role in Kaiju Vision's next film, The Prophecies of Nostradamus, from 1974. This is one of those movies where we spend quite a bit of time with the Prime Minister. The Return of Godzilla is another example of a story like this. His position in the story is interesting because as he represents the Japanese people, he's also put in the same position as the audience from an educational standpoint. The Prime Minister has to learn about Earth geology, but he's not a scientist. Like the audience, he understands the need to do something once he knows what's at stake. This character is effective because he cares about his country. He wants Japan to have a future, and he's put in a situation that very few would envy. He's in a position of power, but in many ways, he's helpless, just like the people of Japan are helpless. He must accept that there's very little that he can do. Nineteen minutes in is when Prime Minister Yamamoto gets out of his car, and the man opening the door for him is Haru Nakajima, who played Godzilla up through 1972. This was his very last role in a movie, in fact. 
Right away, the Prime Minister is greeted by his wife, and also by a woman named Yachan, whose husband worked eight years as a director for the Finance Ministry. The Prime Minister picks up Yachan's baby, and acts as a politician would, but also as a genuine caring person. He then gets this chilling look on his face that's about what he might have to deal with in the future. Inside his mind, you can tell he's worried about what kind of a future this child will have. Ono Dera is at his workplace, the business that he is a pilot for, and Tadokoro, driven as ever, calls him and asks him for the use of the submarine in the Japan Trench, but it's unavailable for a year. This establishes how urgent things are getting, and also how Japan is going to have to get more money and technology to do what's needed to find out what's going on. Around 20 minutes and 27 seconds into the movie is the cameo by Sakio Komatsu himself. He is the one who brings papers in to Yoshimura and then says hi to Onodera. Komatsu is known as the Arthur C. Clarke of Japan, and he even kind of looks like a Japanese version of Arthur C. Clarke. It's a cool cameo, and Onodera even smiles at him after Komatsu says hi. I like it. The scene after this is about Yoshimura taking Onodera to meet Reiko Abe, the daughter of a rich family. She's played by Ayumi Ishida. She is known as an idol, a singer, and an actress. She sang a song called Blue Light Yokohama, which currently is available for viewing on YouTube. She sang that song back in 1969. The discussion between Reiko and Onodera is remarkably similar to the discussion in the book. She's very forward, and she brings up marriage and children, and she's very sexual in her overtures towards him. In the book, she actually says, You don't have anything against sex, do you? He's more reserved and unsure of if he wants to be with her or continue being a pilot and doing his own thing. In the book, on the beach, he takes her bikini off. It seems like her opulent lifestyle and upbringing has made her very open and matter-of-fact. The scene on the beach in the movie reminds me of the beach scene in From Here to Eternity, only a much rockier beach. And just like in the book, Mount Amagi erupts. Mount Amagi is on the Itsu Peninsula, which has a lot of mountains. The eruption, special effects-wise, looks good. It's particularly violent, and fits in with what the story is conveying. In the book, the water on the beach recedes as they escape, which signals a tsunami. In the book, Mount Mihara, which is on the island of Itsuoshima, also erupts. Mount Mihara is the volcano that Godzilla ends up in at the end of The Return of Godzilla from 1984. In the following Shin Godzilla-esque scene, the Prime Minister realizes how helpless Japan is because it's so difficult to predict volcanoes and earthquakes. He asks one of the ministers about the meteorological agency's report on the Japan Trench, and the guy says, what do you mean? That's also like Shin Godzilla, the bureaucracy being caught off guard and having to react. However, the next scene is definitely not like Shin Godzilla, because the Prime Minister is sitting down and listening to scientists explain what's going on with Earth. We get our next geology lesson here about the crust, the mantle, the core, and so on. This scene is a big one because it's important that the audience understand how Earth's solid surfaces move around, and how there's convection in the mantle. And that's why there are trenches and mountain ranges. Having the audience get this is important. Not everyone knew about this, and it's not like they could just look it up on their smartphones. Even though the idea of Japan sinking into the ocean in a matter of a year or so is not realistic, the science behind it is realistic. It's realism, to be exact. There were actual scientific consultants who helped this movie immensely, including a seismic engineer, an oceanographer, a volcanologist, and a geophysicist. This geophysics lesson employs analogies such as comparing Earth to a soft-boiled egg and all kinds of visual aids. They even go into the details of continental drift, such as Pangaea and how the continents drifted apart. I'm fascinated by how the formation of supercontinents is actually a cycle and that in the future, continents will actually join each other again. The Mediterranean Sea may disappear because Africa is crashing into Europe, North America may crash back into Africa, and so what could happen is a supercontinent called Pangaea Ultima. Very interesting. There are plenty of variables with this, though. They then show a fantastic model of subduction zones with what looks like a silicone compound sliding underneath another one, and then the one on top of it slipping and causing an earthquake. This had to have been interesting to watch in 1973 in a theater, and there's definitely no American disaster movie that has done stuff this educational. 
Instead, we were treated to the drama of a man and his wife and his mistress like an earthquake. I don't mean to denigrate Earthquake, because it's a totally different kind of movie than this, and Earthquake is pretty good in its own right. But this movie is really making things understandable, and it conveys how these events occur. Finally, Tato Koro speaks up, and with his usual intensity, impresses upon the Prime Minister that something really bad could happen. He's putting off the other scientists, who are trying to stay general and not sound alarmist. He says something big could happen, I don't know what yet, but you gotta keep researching. Then he's like, gotta go, see ya. Tadokoro having to come back to get his pen is a nice touch, kind of like saying this guy doesn't miss much, and if he does, he's right on top of it. The scene ends with the Prime Minister giving this look towards where Tadokoro left, and he's thinking inside, I better listen to this guy. The first Watari scene is a big deal. In the book, he's 100 years old, which puts his birth date at 1873 or so. It's pretty clear that the main idea is that he and Japan are connected. As he dies, Japan dies. Watari is played by Shogo Shimada. He died in 2004 at the age of 98, so he went on to live almost as long as Watari did. I recognize him from Tora Tora Tora, and others might recognize him from the movie Japan's Longest Day. Definitely a seasoned and experienced Japanese actor. This Watari character was so unexpected when I first saw this movie. It reminds me of the S.R. Haddon character from Contact by Carl Sagan. He was played by John Hurt in the movie version. Essentially, Watari is a rich man who is a huge power player in LDP politics. Though it isn't stated in the movie, Prime Minister Yamamoto is an LDP Prime Minister, and he may have been put into office by Watari himself. It reminds me of S.R. Haddon because we have a very powerful person approaching the most knowledgeable scientist and then trusting that person and their motivation. I don't know what the American equivalent of Watari would be, sort of like Charles Koch, only 100 years old, I don't know. His niece, who acts as a servant, is named Hanai. John mentioned her as the one who takes off her clothes at the end of the book. The Sato soundtrack here is very good. It's mysterious and ominous. Watari is asking about the swallows. The bird migrations have gotten all weird, and the swallows left Japan when this possible change in the magnetism of Earth occurred. It may also have to do with the flow of magma under the Earth, as well as shifts in magnetic polarity. This phenomenon is called geomagnetic reversal. The last time this happened was 780,000 years ago. On average, it happens every 453,551 years. The time it takes to do this is about 7,000 years for the four most recent reversals. The magnetic poles of Earth actually flip. Earth's magnetic south pole is at what's called the North Pole in the Arctic, while the magnetic North Pole is in Antarctica in the South Pole. So when the next reversal completes, the North Magnetic Pole will be at the North Pole and the magnetic South Pole will be in the South. The strength of the magnetic field has gone up and down over the years. It does get weaker, though, when the geomagnetic reversal is taking place. Currently, the magnetic poles are starting to move faster, and they are getting weaker. In the past 150 years, the magnetic field strength has decayed by about 10%. This does have to do with disasters because magma and so much rock down in Earth is magnetic. So earlier in the first presentation, they talked about the convection of the mantle and the subterranean current, it's possible the change in the magnetic field will have an effect on Earth's crust when the subterranean current is disrupted. That would imply issues with volcanoes and earthquakes. When the next geomagnetic reversal occurs, we could experience a mandatory period where radiation from space gets to Earth more because the magnetic field is much weaker. We could have satellites messed up because of the exposure to radiation, navigation systems could get affected, and the electrical grid could get significantly disrupted because of the havoc the magnetic field would be affecting the electricity flow on longer wires. The outer core of Earth is what generates the magnetic field. In southern Africa, there is a large mass of rock that is dense and cool, and what happens is that the rock sinks into the outer core and causes the magnetic field disruption because it disrupts the flow of the rock in the outer core. So this movie is implying that what Japan is going through is a magnetic anomaly occurring because of the geomagnetic reversal. The anomaly could have affected the birds and their migration patterns too. 
Tadakoro says it is terrestrial magnetism, and this could also affect the weather. It could also affect nature. There is some correlation between geomagnetic reversals and mass extinctions as well. There could be a mass bird or fish extinction, but also other mass extinctions in nature. Tadakoro says that he can't put it into words yet, but he has a really bad feeling. Otari is having his own private individual extinction because his health gets worse as Japan sinks. Then we have this great, simple visual aid. Tadakoro gets this thing called a newspaper, and he tears the newspaper and says, You can tell these two pieces were one piece before, right? He's demonstrating to us what Wagner saw when he looked at Africa and North and South America. Those two pieces used to be together when the supercontinent of Pangaea existed. Wegener knew that continental drift occurred. It was right there on the map, but he couldn't scientifically prove it. The movie is right about the story of Wegener, so again, we're in science fiction realm squarely. This is a sci-fi film first, and a disaster film second. That's another thing with this movie. The advantage of going by the book, for the most part, made the explanation scenes mostly necessary, and that's some time that builds up the suspense and the gravity. This next scene is a meeting, too, when things get really serious. Mimura, the secretary to the prime minister, a cognitive scientist, and a cabinet secretary, show up saying they're going to buy themselves a submarine, and they want Tadokoro to be on the staff working for it. The cognitive scientist makes estimates for probabilities of natural phenomena, so that means it's a guy who could tell us when the next polarity reversal could take place, or when the sinking of Japan could happen, or when the next earthquake or volcanoes could even be. So we're heavy on government and scientists, and they're working together. At that moment, there's an earthquake, and a radio announcing the eruption of Mount Kirishima, or possibly it could be referring to a volcano under the sea near Kirishima. The following is what looks like an underwater volcano erupting. The small meeting after this is Onodera's boss getting mad because of Tadokoro getting Onodera to quit his job and join the private company that's doing the submarine work. The human drama is still not very big here as far as influence on the audience and screen time given to the drama, but this movie isn't just about the drama. In fact, Onodera meets another girl in the book and ends up with her at the end, and Reiko and Onodera get disconnected, just like in this movie. Her voicemail to Onodera in the next scene is where she reveals that her very wealthy father was killed in the Itsu earthquake, and so that's startling to everyone. It isn't totally in our faces in the script, but he's clearly chosen career over love and a relationship with Reiko. His work is too important and Japan is too important, so love and sex will have to wait. So this ship that they're on is the research center for getting readings and collecting data and making sense of it. Our two bureaucrats are discussing Watari and how he was the one who got Prime Minister Yamamoto into the presidency of the LDP, which is a different post than Prime Minister. The president of the LDP is the one in charge of the party. The land base in Kasumigawa is an Ibaraki prefecture. I assume they mean that they're at the JASDF base. Kasumigawa is about halfway between downtown Tokyo and the Tokai nuclear power plant, which is featured in Godzilla 2000, and that is the closest power plant to Tokyo. The next scene with the bureaucrats and the helicopter going over Tokyo is like this depressing reverse mirror image of the Gorath helicopter scene, where those Space Defense Force personnel are singing their patriotic song as they fly through the city. Instead, this is sad, and it's pretty well implied that bad things are going to happen to Tokyo in the future. They're saying goodbye to Tokyo in their own way, and it's unfortunate when you have to realize that it's going to be destroyed, and there's nothing you can do about it. There isn't even any Godzilla threat in this movie, and yet Japan's going to get more destroyed than ever. All of Japan's going to get destroyed, and that's more than Godzilla has almost ever done. Now, it doesn't feel like it, but the next scene is the one that leads up to the big one hitting Tokyo. The scientists and the bureaucrats and Onodera are on the ship, and Tadakoro has to have a sit-down for the really, really bad news. Tadakoro says the Pacific side of the mantle is moving fast, and the Sea of Japan's side of the mantle is moving too slow, and it will have to balance out, and that's what Japan is going to get caught in the middle of. He doesn't say this, but it could be related to the geomagnetic reversal and how the outer core gets disrupted during that kind of an event. 
and that's what is causing the imbalance of the outer core. The reason why I say this is that Tadakoro is showing the mantle flow animation again, and he's saying the flow changes so the Earth's crust is massively affected by this disturbance of the mantle convection. He faints, and it is a rather good fainting performance. It's not all overdramatic like a lot of mid-1970s movies from the United States probably would have been. So he goes out to get some air, and this is where things get scary when the earthquake happens. The mantle on the left side pushes Japan down, and the mantle on the right side pushes it up, and in between we've got sinkage. So I'm guessing this earthquake is like a 9.5 because of the absolute devastation, but maybe I don't know. Nearly 55 minutes in, the big tokusatsu payoff occurs, and the Tokyo Mega Quake erupts. It's impossible to overstate how huge this sequence is. It's unforgettable. It reminds me of the earthquake scenes in the movie Earthquake from 1974, but it's so much worse in Tokyo in this movie. In the movie Earthquake, there's no tsunami, but there sure is one here. Tokyo is in a subduction earthquake zone, but Los Angeles is on a slip strike kind of zone, so that's why earthquakes in Tokyo are worse. Tadakoro practically says the magic words to start the destruction going. And he looks at the camera, and the camera zooms out a little bit so that everyone is shown listening to him. And he says, In the worst case, most of the Japanese archipelago will sink into the sea. He's totally consumed by what he sees as inevitable, given the information he's processed and the gut feeling he's developed about the coming events. In the book... The earthquake happens at around 5 o'clock p.m. The special effects in the movie make it look more like 7 to 8 p.m., but whatever. The eventual wildfires in this are evoking the firebombing of Tokyo during the war, and so the audience is going to go through remembrance of that. Americans and most other foreigners aren't relating to it on that deep of a level. This scene also obviously evokes the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake, and this movie came a few months after the 50th anniversary of that. The first thing that happens is the earth all but opens up. The book reads, Somewhere in the east and extending into the city itself, pillars of light were boiling up from the earth, as though to tear it asunder and climbing toward the clouds. That's what those flashes of light are at the very beginning. There's a pretty popular picture from when the 1995 Kobe earthquake occurred. There was an elevated highway that collapsed, and the elevated highway collapsing also reminded me of the 1994 Northridge earthquake, which happened in California. It was the Golden State Freeway northwest of L.A. that had a large part of it collapse. In the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake near San Francisco, that made part of the upper deck of the Bay Bridge collapse, too. The special effects are a lot of the best of what the 1970s tokusatsu world created. The whole sequence lasts multiple chapters of the DVD. Some of the tech used is obviously models, back projections, superimposition, fake blood, etc. The buildings are collapsing, and the carnage is intense. That part really drives home the sheer panic and the instant gridlock created by this event. This movie and the book are making a point that cars are not going to save you in an event like this, and especially the closer that you are to the epicenter. The guy wedged in between two cars did a great job, I think. Only then, when the refinery starts exploding, does the creepy music start in the background. The refineries are most likely the ones in Chiba, which is on Tokyo Bay, or maybe the ones near Kawasaki. There are a bunch of oil refineries there, and in 2011, the earthquake caused a fire in one of the refineries along the bay. You gotta congratulate Teriyoshi Nakano and the other special effects people for creating this much fire in a movie. It likely violated the fire code to stage fires this huge, but oh my gosh, it's impressive. The high rise is collapsing from the movement alone is why I'd like to say that this earthquake is approaching a 9.5 on the Richter scale. Even with all the earthquake proofing, seemingly nothing is a match for this earthquake. One of my favorite aspects of this part of the movie is when the people in the subway station are escaping the underground spots that are collapsing or flooding, and they go outside, and then all the buildings are raining down all of this glass on them from the broken windows. It's filmed so well, too. I'm glad they went the necessary step of showing how bloody this would get, 
all that glass raining down on them too, and we see this blood just gushing out of them. This imagery is really good, and it makes your mind think that this kind of thing is happening everywhere, and just how violent it is. This is another aspect that kind of makes me think this is like a horror movie. The tsunami exploding through the sea walls is so amazing. Any scene with water flooding to this degree is technically difficult and involves all kinds of precision. The shot from street level and watching the tsunami come forward straight for you, that is so scary and so cool. The family's last words scene is nice and disturbing, and it kind of reminds me of the scene from the 1954 Godzilla with the mom and her little kid. In this scene, the grandpa is telling his family that fire was the worst part of the Great Kanto earthquake, and he references the 40,000 deaths at the clothing compound. So he says, just keep the fires out and we'll be fine. And of course, the tsunami hits them like six seconds later. Right after that is the giant billowing smoke at the out-of-control fire at the refineries. Beautiful, and so much fire. Such a gigantic fire. Like in Shin Godzilla, we're treated to a heavy dose of the goings-on from the Prime Minister's standpoint. All of the footage of the burning city is on these televisions and is showing all these explosions. And the explosions recollect the 1923 Kanto earthquake and the firestorms there, as well as the firebombing of Tokyo during the war with the wildfires. There's so much fire in this that it's like a wall of flames that the helicopters are flying into. The gravity is so high in the scene with the Prime Minister where he's watching this mega disaster unfold. And then the voiceover of Prime Minister Yamamoto's inner thoughts. That's very effective. And the music is so understated, but it's giving us all of this dread. There's very little that he can do. The Prime Minister is just watching the city get destroyed. He says the bombardment from the copters doesn't seem to have much effect, but now we have no choice but to rely on the Defense Agency bombers. This is because the bombers are trying to blow up the buildings to create a barrier for the fire. This tactic, however, is not all that successful in wildfires and especially during fire tornadoes. What are the reconnaissance planes and fighters for, he asks, to protect our nation? What is it that we protect? The life and assets of our people? It's Komatsu's point here, is, is that he's asking, what is Japan? Is it the stuff? Is it the land? Is it the people? The scenario at the Imperial Palace really grabs at the heartstrings. This scene shows how authorities can be confused about what to do when they're in an ongoing crisis. They also had to deal with the question of the Imperial family's safety when considering whether to let people escape from the fires into the Imperial Palace. The Prime Minister has to call the head of the Imperial Household Agency, and he tells them to let the people in. Clearly the Prime Minister gets sympathy from the audience by taking this action. Even after all of these disaster scenes, the one with the people trapped by the fire is harrowing, and it has to be a lot of association with what happened in the Kanto earthquake. There are 12 million people in Tokyo when this movie takes place, and the Prime Minister is told that the Self-Defense Force has 1,100,000 emergency meals. So that's ridiculous now that this disaster is so huge, that's a very small amount. The U.S. has run into a situation like this before with Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Harvey. Japan had this happen in 2011, with the Fukushima nuclear meltdowns especially. That earthquake was so bad that Japan hasn't gotten done cleaning up from that. It will be another 30 years or longer to take care of the Fukushima cleanup. I'd predict 50 years. The total number of dead and missing in this movie is 3,600,000. The total deaths in a 7.3 earthquake if it hit Tokyo now would be 9,700 dead and 150,000 injured. That's pretty bad, but typically earthquakes that hit modern cities don't actually kill a lot of people. The 2011 earthquake killed 20,000 and made 2,500 missing. The most killed in an earthquake was the Shanxi earthquake in 1556 in China. A tsunami can dramatically increase the death toll from earthquakes because of drownings, etc., the tsunami and the firestorms caused most of the deaths in this quake in the movie, and also collapses of buildings were a big deal. The short moment regarding his wife's death in the earthquake is good because the Prime Minister is recalling his wife telling him how Japan is so peaceful 
and so she thought that he'd lead this unremarkable term in office, and that's really how leadership works sometimes. You hope to accomplish some things you think need to be done, and you hope something like a catastrophic diastrophism doesn't open up and swallow your whole country into the ocean. Occasions rise that you don't expect, and events that you dread keep happening. If they wanted the movie to be more dramatic, they could have had the Prime Minister just be like, hey, where's my wife anyway, during this whole disaster sequence. If we stopped the movie here, and then tied up loose ends in the plot, this would have been a relatively normal disaster sci-fi movie. If the Tokyo earthquake was the centerpiece of the story, of course. But when the next scene begins, the first stage of the D project is running, but the D2 project is about to get started, and that's about getting as many lives saved as possible before the diastrophism destroys the country. The haunting declaration by the cognitive scientist is that the diastrophism will be 1,000 times the strength of the Tokyo earthquake. And here's the genuinely haunting part, that most everyone will be killed because they won't believe that something like that could actually happen. It has been three months since the earthquake, and I want to think they would have evacuated Japan already if Tadakoro told the public, escape while you can. However, if you ran for the hills every time something on TV told you to do that, we'd all be living in the forest before Y2K happened. The guy who attacks Onodera is the guy from Onodera's old workplace, where he totally ditched in order to be on the front lines of this disaster project operation. Not Yoshimura, not that guy, his old boss, but the other guy. He was at the beginning of the movie, too, when Tadakura was looking at the first submarine. This scene is funny to me because Onodera virtually doesn't say a word, and it's all this other guy talking. The look Onodera has after he's knocked to the ground is kind of unintentionally funny, too. The big takeaway from the next Watari scene, where the power is knocked out during their meeting, is that the scientists in Onodera are there, and they're sure the sinking of Japan will happen. But their reservation about starting an evacuation plan for all of Japan, when most people think everything's gone back to normal, is that the scientists will look alarmist, and they'll be treated like they're crazy or hysterical, and they'll lose their credibility. This part of the movie reminds me of other stories where scientists are saying the following things are going to happen, and then it's turned into a debate, and the message doesn't go anywhere until it's mostly too late to save a whole lot of people. Dr. Nakata says that 3-5% to of the population, so about 5 million, that can be saved, 3-5 to out of 100 million isn't a very good number, but it's better than nothing. The Prime Minister scene is all about getting the government all coordinated to convince the Prime Minister's staff that they're going with the D2 plan. His staff are being political and expeditious. They're concerned with reviving the domestic economy, and like Watari, they're concerned the evacuation plan would look really stupid if nothing else happened with all these predictions of cataclysmic events. To be fair, it would be the stupidest alarmist plan ever if they did try to evacuate Japan and then no diastrophism happened. The Prime Minister says that if one of the scientists starts saying what's going to happen, the Japanese public will be very skeptical of this kind of an announcement. Then the Prime Minister says that there's no way that the funds for an evacuation of this kind of a scale can be hidden away in some kind of discretionary fund in the budget because it would be too large of an amount of money and obviously everyone would notice and start asking what all that money's for. The next scene is absolutely astonishing. It's the first Australia scene, and my international relations mind had a great time analyzing this scene. The actor playing the Prime Minister of Australia is Andrew Hughes. He was in Destroy All Monsters as Dr. Stevenson, not looking very much different. I nearly expected him to have that voice that he got dubbed into. You know, like that, that voice in Destroy All Monsters where he's like, well, they're trying to, you know, that whatever that, I can't do that voice. I don't know if anybody can do that voice. I don't know what it is. That's not his real voice. But this is Andrew Hughes' actual real voice. And he was in almost 30 Japanese movies. I go back and forth between if I think the Prime Minister of Australia is heartless or if the point of the story was to be realistic and actually act like this was a serious thing. He would rather take Japan's treasure and he's not as interested in taking the people, because wherever they come as refugees will eventually just become a new Japan. He does have a point about the land in Australia, though. 35% of the country is desert. In the movie, he says it's 70%. 
so there isn't a lot of room comparative to how the country looks on a map, and desert isn't really an optimal place to build a new country in anyway. The Japanese ambassador is played by Nobuo Nakamura, who's been in many Toho movies, including quite a few covered on the show so far. The ambassador says 5 million total to emigrate from Japan to Australia. It looks like some of the scenes were dubbed, because the voice track and the video track are a little bit out of sync. The Japanese ambassador is telling the Prime Minister, please save us, and it really does hit you that anyone who these other countries can't take is going to perish. There are many moments in this that convey the gravity of the situation very well. I think that if the scene went differently and the Prime Minister of Australia had just said, oh yeah, sure, five million, okay, sure, whatever, or if he said, not even one million, I won't even take that many. Either way, those two scenarios would be less realistic. But since he is the leader of another country, the Japanese audience is told in this scene, basically, that other countries may not accept unlimited amounts of refugees, and everything's not necessarily going to be great. What if it was the U.S. that was sinking, instead, all the way up past the tallest peaks, and that the U.S. had to implore other nations for mercy and to take lots of American refugees? How would that realistically play out? I'd be interested to see which country would take the most Americans. It's surprising how disconnected Onodera is from his family and from Reiko. His family doesn't know that he's stopped working at his old job, and Reiko is looking for him. But then we find that Tadakoro has done the unthinkable. The newspapers showing what Tadakoro looks like are hilarious to me. Two of the newspapers that were shown have just Tadakoro's disembodied head, and it looks so sensational, and he even has that squinty left eye in all these newspaper pictures, and it's just kind of hilarious. The media is screwing up everything, and they're making him look like a kook. But then, at the interview on TV, he does himself no favors by looking like a violent kook. I think that moment looks kind of funny now, but I think Tadakoro is doing the right thing, out of genuine concern for what he is sure will happen, and his instinct ends up being dead right. This is a bad moment for Tadakoro attacking a colleague on live television. His credibility and his career just went down the toilet. This is rather quickly followed up by another tense moment between the D-Plan members involving leaks and Tadakoro's TV appearance. They're upset with Tadakoro's meltdown and how it discredited the whole mission as well as his own career and his respectability. Dr. Nakata sets them straight by demonstrating how leaks work. The negotiations have already begun with other countries, so the info about how Japan is going to be gone, that will get talked about, and the Japanese public will find it out anyway when foreign media report it. So since it's inevitable that this will come out, may as well do it ourselves, but not necessarily with Tadakoro getting really mad at the other scientist when he laughed about the most serious situation that Japan will ever face. Onodera sympathizes with Tadakoro's state of mind, though. Tadakoro might be more depressed than anyone at this juncture. This may be as good of a time to mention this as I will get, but there's a lot of sadness in the country of Japan about disappearing. It's a countrywide depression. That's what makes this more compelling, is if you're Japanese and you're watching this. The fact that it's the whole country that this is happening to, of course, matters. It makes it more meaningful. Now that we're done with the, our three dramatic scenes, the former co-worker on former co-worker violence, scientist on scientist violence, and scientist on scientist almost violence, there's the D2 outline scene with Watari. Watari says one is a priest from Nara, one is a sociologist from Kyoto, and one is a psychologist from Tokyo. And when, and when the first time he said this, I, I was like, what? They all walk into a bar? What? This trio of experts is an interesting way to plan an evacuation phase outline. It would be nice to have more things done this way. Some consider a committee of experts as more preferential during emergencies than political leadership. The Imperial family would have to go somewhere since they're the oldest royal family on Earth. The first idea is that the Imperial family should go to Switzerland, but Watari says one from the Imperial family should go to the U.S. and one should go to Africa. 
It's intriguing that they are going to be separated and they'll be put in different non-Asian countries. Finally, the big reveal is the three cases of how the Japanese nation should move forward. One is to have the Japanese make a new homeland, somewhere, not sure where. That would keep them together, at least. Another idea is that it will be one big diaspora, and the Japanese integrate into their new home countries. I sort of see that happening in real life if this happened, but maybe not. The third one is realistic and very Japanese. It's for those left who can't escape Japan before it falls into the ocean, and the solution is to do nothing about it. It's unavoidable, and many millions will die in this way. It's also the way Watari ends up, we assume, if the diastrophism takes him too. Watari is noticeably sicker in this scene too, mirroring the sickness that the country is going through. The next scene is where Onodera visits his brother in the Kansai region of Osaka. They have just buried their mother, but this was not said in the movie. His brother is considering a job in Canada. Onodera knows the truth about what's going to happen in Japan and his brother doesn't. Onodera tells him that he should go to Canada and the sooner the better. His brother doesn't get why Onodera says that. In the book, Onodera actually says, Japan is... and then he stops himself. In the movie, it's a voiceover of what Onodera is thinking, and he says, Japan is... and the scene ends. Onodera has become drunk on sake by this time, and it's driving him up the wall that all these people around him aren't going anywhere and they need to start escaping, but of course he shouldn't be causing a panic. There's some visuals of his brother when he's drunk, and he's wandering around Osaka. His brother's running, it's implied that he's hit by a tsunami or something, and it looks like he's killed. Just try to put your mind into that spot, though. If you're Onodera, it's like you're walking amongst hordes of dead people, and they just aren't dead yet. They, they're just going to be soon, though. And that's really dark. He is having a breakdown about how his whole country is going to be destroyed. It's tacked right on at the end of his meltdown, but Reiko is the one that bumps into him at the end. So many scenes from the book are in the movie, beat for beat almost. The scene with the Prime Minister and his scientists, and the red and blue map of doom simulation they have going is harrowing. This is the we're all screwed scene. The animations on the screen look obscene at times with that red part stretching out there like that. There's a lot of scientific explanations, and finally someone gets up and says, oh, who cares about that? How long do we have? That's all really matters. How, how much longer do we have? The situation has definitely gotten worse. It's 10 months left, and so nearly everybody's screwed. The prime minister decides he may as well tell everyone in two days or so and at least try to control the panic. He can't be a politician anymore, and he's obligated to warn everyone to save as many as possible. Obviously, transportation infrastructure is paramount. Convert cargo ships to be able to carry more people. Build more airports. Build up seaports so that many can escape. Onodera's end of the drama dominates the second half, while there was more of Dr. Tadakoro in the first half of the movie. Onodera's idea is to get married to Reiko and flee the country. He doesn't want to stay and help the evacuation. That's not what ends up happening, but this is a Japanese disaster movie based on a depressing disaster book, so his dreams are going to get crushed, of course. In the next item of news, though, Dr. Cox, who is the American-looking scientist, he says how a huge diastrophism is going to hit Japan and possibly split the island of Honshu in two. This was done before the Prime Minister's intended conference, so when this scientific society releases their report, that lets the cat out of the bag and all the papers pick up the story. The Prime Minister says that all individuals will be prevented from going abroad starting tomorrow. The reasoning here is that he wants to make the evacuation as ordered as possible so that people could be gathering at certain points to be able to be rescued instead of having just pandemonium occur. Onodera not only tells his co-workers that he's having second thoughts about leaving, but once he gets up to start his escape from Japan, things get a lot worse. Mount Fuji erupts. Reiko is in the telephone booth during the eruption, and I can't help but think it's like, it's like that scene in The Birds when she's in the phone booth and the birds are smacking themselves into the glass. 
The volcano is unrelenting, and finally she's cut off. And this is when the two of them officially get cut off from each other and separated by the disaster. They totally lose track. Has anyone been in a disaster and gotten cut off from the person that you were with? I've heard that that's scary. After some volcano stock footage, we're treated to some great tokusatsu magic. The eruption, the ground opening up, but especially the Lahar special effect was fantastic. A Lahar is superheated mud that's caused when a volcano eruption melts glaciers on the top. The steam looks so good, and the liquid flows in exactly the right places. That looks fantastic. The UN scene is a lot more plot about the specifics of Japan's refugees and how they're to be dealt with. All of these meetings remind me of Shin Godzilla. Now I'm expecting quicker cuts. These numbers are incredible. 7.8 million have admission to 21 different countries. No more than 8.4 million have destinations planned. So 101.6 million Japanese have no plans to go. That is so incredibly grim. The UN representative from the Philippines says the refugee camps will become filthy, crime-infested, disease-ridden slums. He absolutely lets the Japanese have it. This sort of exchange rings so true to what I think would happen in this kind of a science fiction scenario. Gorath is another excellent example of a science fiction scenario done right. Gorath is another complex disaster, and like Gorath, the plan is followed through in the movie, and in Gorath the plan succeeds. However, this plan takes Japan's sinking into account, so there is really no plan to succeed. It's a plan to make the best of a failure. And what is winning in this movie? Is saying 7.6% of the population of 110 million is saving that many winning? There isn't very much winning in this movie. The concept of moving 110 million people is impossible in the time allowed. And if this did really happen, goodbye west coast of the United States, goodbye islands in the Pacific, any place that all these tsunami would hit would be totaled. The water level would go up significantly, I would think, from all the land sinking into the ocean. Earthquakes and volcanoes would probably happen all over. Enough volcanoes erupting could cause global cooling. The movie did actually give us a small bit of that when one government person mentioned how messed up the Korean coast would be from all of the effects of the diastrophism. The montage of the evacuations is good. It's all ordered, which, yes, yeah, it's, it's Japan, but still. Only 2.8 million have gotten out of the country, which is very low. The Prime Minister's animated little speech is a little too strong dramatically, but he has to perform the mission of going to foreign countries to beg them to accept more Japanese people. There are 21 countries mentioned at the UN, and at the time in 1973 there were 135 members of the United Nations, so there are many, many countries that did not accept any Japanese refugees. The last 20 minutes of the film is fabulous, and it makes watching the entire movie more than worth it. Models are used a great deal when we're watching Japan actually break apart. It's meant to be what viewing the country from far up in the atmosphere would look like. The model of the islands looks incredibly convincing, considering it could have looked completely fake if they had the wrong people doing it. Shikoku is the fourth largest Japanese island. The flashing of light when the huge cracks appear is something from the book, like I said. It's like the earth is opening up and there's all this energy just coming out. There are flashes of light and it's meant to enhance the idea that this is an unprecedented breakage of the ground so far down and it releases these noises and these flashes of light from the energy released when this occurs. These shots are mixed with stock footage and then more traditional models of mountains and other features. The shot of the evacuees going down the windy path as volcanoes are exploding as a composite with some superimposition in order to make it look like the debris is overtaking them. The model with the town just sliding into the water is great. If this was real life, could you imagine the tsunami generated by something like that? The scene with the American president is something I'll spend a little time on. The translation is kind of annoying to listen to because he's speaking English and you just want to be able to hear him. But he's saying the U.S. is going to start constructing a place for refugee camps for 2 million Japanese in Nevada, 
Arizona, and Utah. Would this be kind of a little reference to the Japanese internment camps that were used during the war? It sounds pretty ominous if you're going to go in that direction, but at the same time, I don't think that's what this is doing. It seems pro-U.S. to me since the U.S. is mobilizing the 7th Fleet and the Air Force to do everything they can. I wouldn't expect the U.S. to just give Japan all of Texas or something, and those three states more or less make sense and it would seem plausible. I think, again, that Komatsu was trying to be realistic when he was writing this scenario. These scenes remind me of Shin Godzilla when Japan is finding other allies to help with the plan to neutralize Godzilla. They go to France and Germany, among other countries, in that movie. The moment with China in this movie is remarkable because there's actual Chinese people in it. China doesn't do a whole lot, but they send their navy to Kyushu and Okinawa to rescue people. It's a little tense to watch this even now, but there are times where Japan and China cooperate on issues as they arise. I kind of wonder if this story got updated to right now, what the U.S. and China would do in this story. The same goes for Russia and the Koreas. The Soviet Union is mentioned too, which is sending ships to pick up evacuees from rendezvous points. If you're a country close to Japan, I think the incentive to help the Japanese is partially to help people in need, but it's also politically expedient for those other nations to not look terrible by not helping them. There's talk about a new airport at Hamada, which is 40 miles northwest of Hiroshima, on the coast of the Sea of Japan. This implies that they built some large runways and a new airport in this city of about 50,000 or so in population, and it has large port facilities and rarely gets hit by strong quakes. So that's why this particular city is mentioned in the country, because it sinks from east to west also, more or less, so it makes sense that this city would be one of the ones left. The D-team members discuss how the world has come to help us, but the tragedy is that they waited until the diastrophism actually started to sink whole islands to give the Japanese a hand. But these two guys conclude that's how it works. That's more Shin Godzilla kind of bureaucratic dialogue we're used to hearing now. In the book, there is a riveting page or so where there's a Pan Am Boeing 747 with almost 500 people on it taking off at Osaka Airport. As soon as the plane starts its takeoff roll, a huge earthquake begins. It reminded me of the scene in the 1974 movie Earthquake, where the plane is trying to land and an earthquake occurs. The scene in the book ends with the plane taking off, and then it's implied that that could have been the last plane out because the earthquake just completely destroyed everything. The view of Osaka is terrifying when they fly over it. The water is so high that only the top of Osaka Castle is still above water. So it's just like an Atlantis-related story. Everything is sinking and very fast. Anytime there's water in special effects, I admire the extra difficulty the water makes because it can be really destructive, and if you don't get it right the first time, you're in for a lot more work to get it right the second time. The models of the islands sinking looks really great, and there are nice effects along with it. It looks like dry ice is creating all of the steam. It's what's around that which creates the atmosphere. The explosions and the Earth's crust breaking apart looks great too. The Sanriku coast is the northeast coast of the main island of Honshu. A north-south crack breaks off where the northeast part of Honshu is, which is the Tohoku region. The view of this is sort of the same view as a satellite, or like the view from the International Space Station would be. The view of Hokkaido looks like the south part of the island is breaking apart. Then we're taken to the Kansai region and the Tango Peninsula. It's on the west coast. The evacuation into the boats in that scene is pandemonium. It's kind of tough to watch because you realize that they're going to get hit by a tsunami and everybody's too panicked to listen to the warnings. Then we go somewhere else and Reiko is looking out to the sea. Onodera is the tough guy in the helicopter, and he's warning everybody of the tsunami. He does a good job acting, and even though he's ignored, he is correct. The tsunami coming at them, that shot, is so ominous. The model ships hit by the water is literally just a bunch of water thrown at them, and all this water gets thrown towards the camera. When we get back to Reiko, she's in the rain trying to get to safety. I don't mean to laugh at this part, but it is so, like, inappropriate to have this music going on. It's way too joyful. They're playing the love theme of uh, Reiko and 
Onodera at the time that she's running through this rain, she's getting pelted by all these water droplets and everything. I had to laugh at this part because it's just so, uh, it's just inappropriate. The fact that a tsunami happens at the end of the music is, and destroys literally everything is, is ironic considering that the music was not exactly the right tone for that. Because like the music is like la da 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 tsunami, boom, just gets everything. I think it's just is it's it's not the right uh, cue to be using at this time. But I, it's not that big of a deal. But it, I not only did I notice this, but when I showed the movie to at least two other people, they also mentioned that, and they didn't even know the tsunami was coming. <laughs> The overview model of Kyushu and Ok. <laughs> Sorry. The overview model of Kyushu and Okinawa shows us how much of Japan is left, and it, and at, towards the end of that shot, it pans down to Okinawa, and it looks like Okinawa is almost totally gone. The steam coming from the map model is probably uh, symbolic of volcanic action. The next Dr. Cox scene gives us some more that the book definitely touches on. He's confused as to why the central part of Honshu hasn't broken yet. And he says there's a huge amount of energy that's located in that spot, but the island hasn't broken there yet. And this is the difficulty with predicting earthquakes. Just because there's a lot of energy potential in one place, that doesn't tell you much about when the earthquake is actually going to occur. But once that huge part breaks, it will speed up the sinking of the rest of the island. The model says there are only 11 days left, and so panic sets in regarding the Imperial family. The Imperial family has to be moved to Switzerland. It's funny, just a year before this, in Godzilla vs. Gigan, Switzerland was referred to as a place for evil corporations to hide, but this year, one year later, Switzerland is a nice, secure place for the Imperial family to hide from all of the calamity. Finally, Honshu, the main island, erupts in the center. The smoke coming out of the crack looks so nice, and the model of the electricity towers all mangled from the earthquakes looks great. There is so many nice little touches like this. It looks so pretty. And when you have all the CGI that you could want in the whole world, for some reason this just looks more organic and just looks special. The pictures of all the places around the world are snapshots of all the activity happening. And it's sort of like saying, here's the world at the time Japan sank. The un-PC Australian Prime Minister returns, and this more un-PC Newsweek cover is a bit of a shocker, calling the Japanese survivors kamikazes. Onodera is the poster boy for the struggle of trying to save every last Japanese person from the cataclysm that's taking place. Onodera has really changed from where initially he wanted to escape to Switzerland with Reiko, to becoming a folk hero and a humanitarian. Sure, he's still part of the D Project, but there's more at work here than just that being his job or something. I would suggest it could possibly be his patriotism or his national spirit that has activated him and made him stay in the dangerous area trying to save people. The Australian Prime Minister makes some rather cringy comments about how the fleeing Japanese are like kamikazes spreading themselves all over the globe. His assistant isn't very much better, seeming eager to wipe the country off the map. This is another moment for the story and for the movie to convince the Japanese people that none of these countries is going to treat them like their brothers and go out of their way to take the most refugees. The message is that they have themselves and each other to depend on the most and that they will be the ones to continue Japan's future. The government operation is over, the D-plan is over, and most of Japan is gone now. They're exhausted from working. Lastly, the final Watari scene is upon us. Just as Japan is dead, he's dying too, of course. The part John LeMay mentioned, where Watari says he wants to see Hanai naked and she does it, in the book... He looks at her for a second, and then he closes his eyes. That's what the book says happens. And that would have been interesting, having that part included in this ending. It might have seemed too much of a contrast with with the disaster happening in the background here. Since the rest of the ending is sad, meaningful, yet depressing, I'd be happy even if that scene 
was made and then cut and then maybe included as a special scene on the DVD release or something with English subtitles. By the way, I'd buy that DVD with English subtitles, the original Japanese version of this movie, hint, hint. Watari tells Hanai that she should find not just a Japanese man, but any man, and get married and have children and live a happy life. Watari is thinking about how the world would be in a post-Japan state. Watari is okay with her just finding someone who will be the one, whatever their ethnicity or nationality is. What I would not have guessed is the part about Tadokoro coming to Watari's private residence and deciding to commit suicide by staying with Japan until the last of it sinks. There are suicides mentioned in the book, but there's not much in the movie about suicide. The part about that in the book is where it's giving us the final figures of how many people escaped, died, etc. So there were 70 million evacuated, 12 million dead, and 30 million left on the sinking islands. 30 million, which later they say 20 million, is a horrifically high number. That's more like a figure for how many deaths happen in major world wars. The ones left on the islands, some of them committed suicide, and many of them were men in their 70s or older who wanted to trust Japan's future with younger generations. Now, this part is not touched on in the movie, but it's interesting. That appears to be what Tadokoro is doing. It makes sense. It did not come out of nowhere that Tadokoro decides to do this. His suicide may also have to do with the shame that he feels from his disastrous TV appearance, because that's likely why we don't see him around as much in the second half of the movie. I wasn't surprised that suicides would be mentioned as a way out for many, but Tanakoro doing it was less predictable. Tanakoro says in the book that when he found out Japan was dying, he wanted to die with her. Watari says that it is a love suicide. Then Watari says, Ah, the Japanese, a strange race indeed, unquote. This is absolutely the best time for Kaiju Vision's philosophy to kick in, because there's no moment in this movie that conveys the Japanese national spirit more than this one. The people staying on the sinking islands love Japan so much, and in that kind of way, that they don't want to live in a world without Japan. They're connected to the mountains, and the forests, and the land in general, and they chose to go to death with the land. It's exactly the right thing to guess would happen, given the national spirit of some Japanese. If this happened now, would there still be a lot of suicides? Hmm, yeah, definitely, no question. In the book, Watari also admits he's half Japanese and his father was a Chinese monk. We're shown the zoom out of Earth, where it looks like Japan is all gone. The movie is missing something in the book that I really wanted to see. In the end of the scene with Watari, there is supposed to be a typhoon hitting Japan during that scene. That is supposed to have helped finish everything off and also add to the destruction in this story. It disrupts the last-ditch efforts by the rescue crews to save people as well. The ending is really something. Reiko is on a train, and the title reads, Somewhere on Earth so she could be in Siberia or who knows where. She looks so hopeless and just dead tired and just dead inside, too, because of all that she's been through. Meanwhile, Onodero's on another train, and it looks like he's in Arizona or Utah or something, and this music during the train moments is terrific for that part out in the desert. The Arizona music is great because it sounds like it's from a Western. It sounds like a, a John Ford film or something. It's amusing considering how bleak the movie is. The last note in Sato's soundtrack is one note from a trumpet, and it sounds exactly like a train horn. They're on their way to build a future for the Japanese people again. When I learned that there had been talk of a sequel, I thought, well, how's that going to work, especially if you're picking up where you left off? Because that's a completely different kind of movie. Like a movie about the aftermath of a disaster? That doesn't really sound all that fun on, just on paper. But like John LeMay said, they went in a different direction for the sequel. Rebuilding society in the aftermath of a disaster film isn't as interesting as a disaster film itself. The movie has taken us so far. We've gone from Japan existing to Japan being completely gone. 
the audience has meditated on what it means to be Japanese and what Japan even is. This was a huge phenomenon at the box office. It's definitely one of my favorite tokusatsu movies ever. It's big, it's atmospheric, and it's full of meaning. It teaches us about the Japanese national spirit. Is it the land? Is it the people? It's both, but in the end, it's the people, and they must continue living and surviving. This movie is such an enriching experience to watch and enjoy. Well, that finishes the chronological run-through of this epic film. That concludes part two, and I will move on to our related topic. You're listening to KVR Kaiju Vision Radio.